first six to depart for Australia. Eastern Highlands focused on growing economy and slight reprieve from overcrowding. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Sunday's news. The first six out of 49 seasonal workers from Medang Urban District will be travelling to Australia tomorrow. Recruited under the Pacific Labour Scheme, the six are the first from Medang District who will get to experience work in Australia through a three-year visa in skilled labour. Four districts were selected under the Australian High Commission Seasonal Workers Project. We were invited in this program in 2018. Madang took the lead in setting up our structures, administrative structures and systems on pre-selecting the best workers that we would send down that would not only represent Madang but represent the country. Kramer says 49 seasonal workers from a district in PNG is again, as opposed to past experience relating to bad behavior, discipline issues and improper conduct which had resulted in seasonal workers in PNG being excluded from the program. In the past we were excluded uh, from this program because uh, we've had issues with Papua New Guineans going down. Um, where anyone's just gone down, discipline issues, getting drunk, fighting, causing problems, not working properly, sending the wrong workers. And on that basis, the Australian farmers and workers blacklisted Papua New Guinea as a, not a preferred uh, location to recruit uh, workers. A requirement of the program was to have a robust structure in place at the district level on how workers were selected for seasonal work. Most come from both rural communities and urban. Uh, we did it within a rural communities, we did it within a clan base. So the clan selects their best workers that represent the clan. So when they earn their income, it's not for them to come back and get rich and um, spend all the money and cause problems. So the money goes back to the clan and the clan then uses that money to support their family. The program is said to be proving its worth in Medang. To the future, I think most of the youths working, uh, living in Medang, if they go down and work overseas, I think there will be no more social problems increasing in Medang. The participants appeal to other youths in Medang to make use of the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. My appeal to the youths, those uh, living, doing nothing, just that uh, we have a uh, tuna factory there, we got globe there, try to go apply and do something so that we'll have some experience to apply for mm -hmm. such program for a better living future and it will benefit the whole entire community and Medang province. And at Cora, National MTV News. The Eastern Highlands Provincial Government aims to collect and keep a proper record of goods and services tax it generates through the Internal Revenue Commission office in Goroka. During the 2020 budget presentation, Eastern Highlands Governor Peter Numo highlighted existing policies that will be implemented to grow the provincial economy. These policies include the farming of rice and an increase in coffee production. Under the theme Growing the Economy, Eastern Highlands Province presented its budget of 323 million kina to Treasury. This money plan, made up of 256 million 191,000 kina in grants, 23 million kina from internal revenue, and 32 million kina rolled over from 2019. They roll over plus internal revenue new estimate and the functional grants estimate adds up to 323 million 123,600. That's the overall uh, budget for yep. the people of Islam, Islamic province. Eastern Highlands is one of the biggest producers of coffee in Papua New Guinea and it is entering into a rice farming project. Its current challenges are proper records and management of how revenue collected through GST is used to improve government services within the eight districts. We want to also know how much money we are collecting in terms of tax. I mean, the IRC is collecting in terms of tax. Right now, Eastern Islands provinces, maybe it applies to other provinces. We are totally in the darkness. 
When receiving the province's budget, Treasurer Ian Lingstaki provided an overview on steps taken by the national government in improving the country's economy. The national government has every uh, confidence in his ability um, to, to deal with some of these issues and I hope that I've got some good news at the end of the year. But GST issue nationally, uh, um, we have a huge issue. The Treasurer also agreed that more focus must be given to IRC offices as it is a revenue source. Thakla Gunga, National MTV News. A life skills training program offered by the National Youth Development Authority in partnership with the Highlands Youth Training and Rehabilitation College in Jawaka aims at changing the mindsets of youth in Hela and Southern Highlands provinces. The program is offered under the Ministry of Youth, Religion and Community Development to address law and order problems in these two hotspot provinces. This is a new approach taken to address issues rather than sending disciplinary forces to address law and order issues. The new approach is an intervention to change the mindsets of youths to see life as not just fighting and killing each other or drinking homebrew and smoking marijuana. About 20 youth council executives in Hela and in Bongu in Southern Highlands province participated in 10 days of leadership training at the Highlands Youth Training and Rehabilitation Center in Jiwaka. Put a bigger submission into the national government so this is allocate enough funds to run the programs and projects to empower our youth. They were given programs in the areas of personal and leadership development and basic computing skills. They were taught about the qualities of being a good leader and skills to excel in the four aspects of life, spiritual, mental, physical and social. Hela province is a good place. We still have this kind of problem, but it's just that we leave the youths on the street. Hela and Southern Highlands provinces were selected because of the alarming statistics which showed that in 2019 alone in Hela, at least 300 lives were lost to tribal fighting. Millions of Kina in properties were destroyed and 68% of youths are unemployed and not productive. That's the mention that we want to arrive at is volatile. There is no peace. We want to build peace and then talk about development later. National Youth Development Authority Director General Joe Itaki said the authority under the Ministry of Youth, Religion and Community Development will continue to empower youths in the tribal zone areas to change their mindsets. Itaki said this is a new approach to change the pattern of blaming youths to encouraging them to excel in life. The worst long, the potential long, the revenue ally like generated in said long pass, national pass a big plan, big plan. So we need to protect that revenue coming into the national coffers. So in that context, now all agencies were directed to implement the one or two programs long Elana. NYDA will continue to partner to offer other programs such as financial literacy programs. Vasinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. The Department of Provincial Local Government Affairs and the New Ireland Government have signed a Memorandum of Understanding for the establishment of the Village Record Book System. The signing took place at the official government house in Kaviang between administration executives and DPLGA. The MOU allows the New Ireland Government some functions of planning and electoral roll functions. This will see the establishment of the provincial database system and training ward recorders and LLG offices. New Ireland Province is the first to enter into the partnership arrangement with DPLGA. St. Paul High School will soon ease its issues of student overcrowding. A groundbreaking ceremony for a double classroom was done by local MP Peter Isoaimo recently in front of students, staff and parents. Teachers say the classroom is timely to address overcrowding and help build its status as one of the new high schools in the Kairukuhiri district of Central Province. 
A food sharing welcome was given to the Kairokwiri MP and the district administration at the school grounds. The visit signifies the commitment by the Kairokwiri District Development Authority to build a double classroom for the school. MP Peter Isoaimo says the DDA is spreading its finances thinly to help all sectors. Specifically and purposely for what I'm here today is to announce and also do the groundbreaking ceremony so your double classroom can get underway. Um, for you people to have a good learning environment or school infrastructure. St. Paul was initially a primary school. With more enrollments, the school is being transformed to a day high school. This will now be the second high school in the district. The local MP did not promise additional support, but says the school must be given the adequate support to build its status. But as soon as more and more funding becomes available, I will announce or advise in due course and what is coming next for the school. Local staff and school administration say the New Day High School has many issues. Overcrowding is one. Despite these and funding issues, the local MP urge students to try for the best. Keep aiming high. Do the best you can. Bring your school name up, you know, by studying very, very hard and attaining very good academic excellence. The double classroom will cost about 250,000 kina. Jack LaPauva Jr., National MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. We'll be back with more right after these messages. Stay with us. Welcome back. The Marapi Stephen government has continued to emphasize its focus on efforts to combat corruption. When Parliament resumed on Tuesday, Prime Minister Marape again emphasized that the government would be pushing for the passing of the Independent Commission Against Corruption Bill and whistleblowers legislation within this session. The ICAC bill is one that has taken several years to table. It is intended to be an independent constitutional body that will have powers to investigate, arrest and prosecute cases of corruption both in the public and private sector, working alongside law enforcement agencies. Speaking to MTV News, Police Minister Brian Kramer explains that while the bill will allow whistleblowers to report any allegations against any one person, police will still carry out standard policing procedures based on sufficient evidence provided. Um, evidence will decide on whether someone gets arrested or not. It is based on evidence. If individuals believe that they have been uh, arrested on bogus charges or, milis uh, or malicious prosecution, then they have every right to go to court and seek redress in the courts by asking, uh, seeking a permanent injunction. But they then have to provide evidence to demonstrate that their arrest is politically motivated without any basis of evidence. Explaining further the workings of an evidence-based case in court. And the court establishes there is sufficient evidence, then it will commit that case to the national court if on serious offenses. And during the national court uh, proceedings, there will be a trial, and the accused gets to question and, and um, cross-examine the evidence against them. Despite the bill's purpose and objective to improve governance and step up on the fight against corruption, the efforts on bureaucracy, especially in regards to the whistleblowers' legislation, has been disappointing, with the National Executive Council still awaiting the legal clearance from respective officers responsible, which is a current concern. According to the Attorney General, there needs to be agency in ensuring these legislations are completed, with the bureaucracy urged to ensure that they are in tune with the government's efforts. This week's Parliament, um, the government, the Prime Minister has announced that we will be pushing for the passing of the ICAC legislation and also the whistleblowers. And this will improve governance and step up um, on the fight against corruption. Anit Kora, National MTV News. More ambulances are needed in the nation's capital and central province. St. John Ambulance Commissioner Matthew Cannon says only three ambulances are not enough to cater for the growing demand in delivering emergency medical services. Commissioner Cannon says the health department is providing funding but is not adequate. With more efforts in attending to emergency cases, St. John needs more ambulance in the city. 
Commissioner Cannon says the city is growing and more emergency cases are reported every day. He wants more fleet of ambulance. Uh, at the moment, um, we uh, have funding only for three ambulances for the city. Um, we must increase that to six this year. Um, we've reached out to donors to help us with more four-wheel drive ambulances because uh, Brian, so Brian Bell Foundation has been outstanding in supporting us with the two we currently have, but the demand in the, uh, is increasing, particularly within Central Province, and we need to be able to access patients wherever they are um, on dirt roads within Central Province. The three mobile ambulances are saving the city 24-7. The SDA Commissioner says those support has been given more ambulances is needed to extend services to Central Province. Canon hopes relevant government authorities will address this by funding a set of new ambulances customized to serve the outskirts of the city. Ambulance is called upon 10,000 times in the year just in this city alone and we must be able to respond to those emergencies um, because it's, a, it's, an essential, it's an essential emergency service just like police or fire. St. John Ambulance has been receiving financial assistance through various agreements signed with the health department. But with funding constraints, funding has been cut and untimely. Commissioner Cannon says, like police and the fire service, its services is also of high concern as it tries to save lives of people. We do need that baseline funding from, from the Department of Health and from the NCDC to be able to staff those ambulances and make sure that there's fuel and equipment. Um, just like the fire service has fire trucks on standby, just like the police service has uh, thousands of police officers within the city. Jack Lapava Jr. National MTV News. St. John Ambulance Commissioner Matthew Cannon has appealed to citizens to not move a person who is in cardiac arrest. He says keep them on the scene, call 111 and start CPR. In a majority of cases, the Green Angels are minutes away. But you should not move them unless we tell you to do that. You cannot do CPR effectively in a moving vehicle, let alone on the back seat of a five door. It's not possible to do that. So we're seeing this far too often where we're only minutes away, we're a much more efficient service than we, than we were, say, five years ago. And with the help of the doctors and the emergency department, our, our men and women are trained to a much higher standard. They're fully equipped with defibrillators and life-saving uh, devices. And uh, what we're seeing is there's people are loading these people into private vehicles. They're pulling them out of wreckages. They're causing them severe pain, severe harm, and they're putting lives at risk. The Catholic Professional Society held its 2020 Dedication Eucharist celebration at the St. Joseph's Parish, Barocco yesterday. In a small celebration, members of the society took their oaths of membership and pledge of commitment to serve the church and society through their professions and experiences. Candles were lit and carried to symbolize their commitment as members of the society. Society President Paul Harrignan thanked all members who have taken the bold step forward to carry their cross of courage as members of the Catholic professionals. The Mass was celebrated by the CPS Spiritual Director, Father Ambrose Pereira. The band P2UIF has been around for over 20 years and continues to woo fans and audiences at their live concerts. This was seen yet again last night at Unitex Duncanson Hall in Ley, where the band brought their musical abilities and synergy to the stage. They played a few of their popular songs, Jacob's Well and Lord Lead Me On, amongst many others. Lucy Kopana with this story. For those who follow Peter UIF's music, this song is arguably amongst the band's well-known songs. The drums, the bass, acoustic, Lead guitar, keyboard and vocals were all in sync as they brought back some of their popular songs to a wowing audience at the Dunkinson Hall at the University of Technology in Leigh. The band was formed in the 90s, named after a mission plane that crashed. And its call sign was P2UIF. We did not know that the 
innocence of what that crest did was, it just gave birth to something new and we've been here for the last nearly 26 years now. Even after 25 years of being in the business of making music, so much energy is still brought to the stage. Lead vocalist Peter Bogemboa attributed this to the band's Christian faith. The word of the Lord just, it, his message are new every morning. Therefore, when whatever God speaks to you, it just energizes you, refreshes you. So you are always at that place to refresh others. While most people enjoy the music that is being played, what you see on stage is the result of practice, hard work, time and commitment. In fact, I used to practice a lot, practice for eight hours a day. Uh, when asked about why he continues to play music, this is what the band's drummer, Ben Hakalitz, had to say. I think it's an exciting art. Uh, I'm older now, but still thinking like a young kid when you get on the stage with everybody else and having that amazing uh, connection on stage and that musical thing that we do together is just like instinct. But it's great, it's great to come up on stage and, and do play with those guys that I've played with for nearly 25 years, now 26 years. So. This gospel band has set a benchmark in PNG music over the years with their style of music. Bogembo said PNG's music industry is still growing and has unique sounds to offer the world. Your traditional melody that comes from your roots, if you can capture that and maybe marry it with other ideas of music and present it, the world hasn't had that. And PNG is actually rich in, in that context. With the next generation of musicians coming up, the band shared the stage with band bassist Richard Mogu and his daughters, who graced the stage with a couple of their original songs last night. They're today singing, and it's just wonderful to see them like you grow your flower and they get bigger and they're blooming. It, it, it's just the joy of seeing our own children uh, being able to write their own songs about God and their experiences. It's, I think it was more, one of the most powerful experiences just seeing those, uh, the Mogul girls. After 25 years in the music scene, they have plans to step away from playing in big concerts to reaching out to rural PNG through their music. People, maybe most have heard us on radios and possibly in the cities and the cassettes, but it will be another thing for us to just be with the people, ministering together and interacting. So. As for the concert last night, the reactions and applauses from the audience were enough to show that they will remember this night for a long time coming. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, late. Don't go anywhere, we'll have more when we return, including stories making headlines overseas. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. Youth activists met with United Nations officials, governments and civil society to launch Mission 1.5. It is a campaign that aims to bridge the gap between people and governments on ambitious climate action. Mission 1.5 aims to give 20 million people around the world the opportunity to have their say on ways to limit climate change that they want to see adopted by government leaders. The campaign, led by the United Nations Development Programme, hopes to address the disconnect between citizens and governments. The campaign is built around an internet and mobile-based video game developed by the UNDP alongside experts in game development, climate science and 
and public polling in which players take on the role of climate policy makers and make decisions to try to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. After the game, players are asked to vote on key climate actions they want to see adopted. The Kumul 417 were treated to a traditional dish when members of the PNG community living in Melbourne visited the PNGDF soldiers in Omeo, Victoria. They arrived on Saturday morning, rested for a while and prepared mumu and aigir, which was served during lunchtime yesterday. The visit was described as a gathering to honour and thank Kumul 417, deployed to assist in Australian bushfire relief exercise. So far, PNGDF soldiers have assisted in rebuilding bridges clearing up fallen trees on the main highways, delivering food and water supplies and rescuing native Australian fauna. The deployment is for a three-month period and will end in March. However, depending on the assessment of the relief exercise, more can be deployed. And turning overseas now, the French Health Ministry has announced the first coronavirus death in Europe. The French Health Minister says an 80-year-old Chinese tourist who had been hospitalized last month died yesterday. The patient who came from the Chinese province of Hubei had a lung infection caused by the virus. China has declared war on an invisible killer, sending more doctors as well as soldiers into the worst affected area. But now the new coronavirus has claimed its first victim outside Asia, an elderly Chinese man who traveled to France. Last night I was informed of the death of an 80-year-old patient who'd been hospitalized at the Bichat Hospital since the 25th of January and who was suffering from a coronavirus lung infection. Back in China, all those returning to the capital Beijing after what's been an extended holiday have been told they must quarantine themselves for two weeks. Passengers of many nationalities are still stuck aboard the Diamond Princess off the coast of Japan. 285 people have now tested positive for the virus on the ship and America says it will remove all of its citizens tomorrow and fly them home. There's no such escape from Wuhan, the Chinese city where the outbreak began. Officials have reported more than 2,400 new cases there and 140 new deaths. In the rest of the world, we only have 500 fa five cases and two deaths, while in China we have more than 66,000 cases. Let me be clear, it's impossible to predict which direction this epidemic will take. Beijing claims it's acted quickly and decisively to try to stop the spread, but few are willing to predict what the global impact of this crisis will be. You're watching Sunday's news, some sporting updates in Chukai Sports when we come back. Stay tuned. Chukai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. To the OFC in Group B, Lay City and Henderson delivered an OFC Champions League Classic with a high-scoring draw at a white-hot Luganville Soccer City Stadium. Both teams had their time with the lead in a match where three penalties were awarded. In the end, the match ended in a three-all draw. It was a high-scoring affair between Lay City FC and Henderson Eels from Solomon Islands yesterday in the Group B of the OFC Champions League in Luganville Soccer City Stadium, Vanuatu. Lay City meant business and right in the first minute tried their chance at goal. Chance for the P Lay City kept the momentum going for them and it paid off. A cross kick by Raymond Gunemba in the third minute capitalized on by Emmanuel Simon. But the Henderson Eels were not too concerned and things went to their favor when a penalty kick was put through the net by Tutizama Tanito. For Henderson Eels. The scores remained leveled until the 36th minute. A powerful kick by Rafael Lea literally broke through the net. A nice shot that went through the net. 
Henderson Eels took the 2 1 lead into half time. The second half was anyone's game as the game remained tight, but it was again Emmanuel Simon who broke through the net and leveled the scores at 2 2. Whistle blows and the ball goes in. Goal number two for Lai City. Scored by Emmanuel Simon. With the scores leveled at 2 all, there was much anticipation by the crowd. And Nigel Dabinyaba made sure he capitalized on his opportunity. Lai City into the box. And another goal for Lai City. Lai City has scored. Lai City looked like their lead was intact. But unfortunately, that was short-lived. A yellow card to Lay City made it possible for the Henderson Eels to take an easy opportunity with Tutiza Matanito, getting one past Lay City's Ronald Warrison. Kick is taken and the ball goes in the net. Another goal for... And the match ended in a 3-3 draw. Fidelis Tukina National MTV Sports. The ID24 Rugby League competition began their final playoffs at Tarama Barracks today. Tournament sponsor Derek Mara presented a cheque of 20,000 kina to the tournament directors. This money will be used to purchase trophies, shields and other necessities for the competition. I start last year, now come uh, by goal of finals uh, this year. We um, played like a top eight. Top eight by all of finals. Na uh, commitment long. Crab this play league where uh, chairman want them all official staff. Uh, and we died low two years ago. Uh, but then me Pini Eastern Islands me come. Me are na me crab back. Na time me crab back and me talking all leaders. Low run him now. All, 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 all clever. All be run him. The Maratha off-season rugby league competition played its quarter-final matches yesterday. The match between M3 Bulldogs and Telapia was tough from start to finish. Telapia, the eventual winners after a grueling encounter. Godwin Eki reports. To this day, the young generation of Morata have carried on from their fathers and grandfathers and now playing in the Morata Rugby League competition. For the Talapia club, many of the players in the team are unemployed youth who have shown interest to play rugby league. They say sport has really changed the attitude of the players who have taken a new direction away from illegal activities. Before going into the field, Captain Stanley David told MTV Sports that the team was looking forward to winning the quarter-final match. Today's game, eh, my blood boys to me, I'm blah, my blood preparing my blood, no, can't take it this like game, it's a final blah, blah, nah, me got trust all boys to me, it's a blah, blah, one set, blah, blah, winning this like game, because my blood, 100% me got trust all. We play stop good now. Come, we play think him game one, the game law. Come now play the final room last so. After the kickoff, it was a very tough match as both teams locked horns in the field. Having great defense and attack at hand, it was difficult to penetrate through to the try line. The momentum shown from both sides was fierce, with great ball work and defense from the forward. Both Talapia and Bulldogs found it difficult to score in the first half. Half-time score, nil all. In the second half, it was a messy and slippery race as the Port Mosby rain washed the Talapia. Bulldogs, in the other hand, who were the dominant side, still found it difficult to score as Talapia managed to defend well. At full time, both teams walked away with no score, but the extra 10 points given was crucial for both sides to at least score and win the match. Talapia, on the other hand, managed to slip through the slippery turf to score their first try and one that gave them the cut to make the semi final next weekend. Me play the self sponsor, me plan us a sponsor out law, some law business houses or like I know about. Telapia Club is self funded and needs support from business houses in Murata to come forward and support the youth. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. Don't go away, we'll have more of Trukai Sports when we return. True Kai Sports. 
Welcome back to Chukai Sports. National boxing coach Mark Kettle is currently training PNG's team to the Olympic qualifiers in Jordan. He says recent developments have seen more interest from youth within the city looking to join the sport of boxing. He says the first set of youth are already training alongside the national team. Godwin Eki with the details. This year, Boxing PNG, apart from its upcoming national and international tournaments, now has another responsibility, and that is to teach and mould the new and upcoming boxers who have come through this year to join the sport of boxing. As Boxing PNG prepares to train its national team, it is also their responsibility to help breed the new line of boxers. National coach Marketo says having this new line of boxers train alongside the national team will only motivate them to go even further and one day be part of the national team who can represent PNG at the world stage. Keto says training will continue for the new boxers, but at the meantime, with the AGM already done, national events for this year are not set as yet. Just recently we had our AGM uh, in December last year so we had some new executives in the team. Some of them are old ones so they are going to plan out the programs. Do you have any president? Uh, the president is the same one, Mr. John Avia and uh, we have the same general secretary but there are some new executives where they are in the team now so hope they work together to bring the standard of the boxing up. To the next level, yeah. In regards to PNG Games, he said the games have been deferred to next year. He says in the meantime, Boxing PNG's main focus is to prepare the national team travelling to Jordan for the upcoming Olympic qualifiers for this year's Olympic Games in Tokyo 2020. Our focus now is for the Olympic qualifying in uh, Jordan. That's for Oceania region and Asia region only. Continent, sorry, Asia and Oceania continent. Uh, we just, um, I just like him support Blue Yupla or uh, Lidas Blue Yumi. Uh, I think boxer, boxing and also other sports, we have talent here to bring Papua New Guinea to the world stage. We just need support from the people of Papua New Guinea and also our good uh, members. Uh, for these four athletes, they will not be representing their families and their self but they will be representing the nine or ten million people of Papua New Guinea and also the government of the day. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. Israel Falau has taken to the field for the first time since his controversial signing with the Catalan Dragon Super League team, scoring just minutes into the game. As ABC reports, his contribution helped his French club to beat Castleford Tigers 36 to 18. Pignon, uh, in southern France, which is the home of the Catalans Dragons, which of course uh, Israel Falau is now playing for. Uh, he had his debut match in front of about 9,000 locals here this evening, uh, and I think the crowd was pretty pleased. He scored uh, after touching the ball for the first time on the field, six minutes in to the first half, and he did score for the team. Uh, the coach was very pleased um, after the match. He said he played well in defence as well but of course it's not his rugby league that everyone is talking about and causing the controversy it's his views and the views of, uh, that he's posted before on social media that um, had him sacked from rugby union in Australia now his coach uh, um, is very uh, supportive though of Israel Falau and he is not apologetic for signing the player when I go to sign a player, I'm talking from a football perspective, I go to sign a player, I work out what type of person he is. Is he a good person? Is he a good player? Will he add value to the team on and off the field? Not judging him on any political or religious uh, belief that he's got. We said in the statement what we said. He will not repeat anything that was said. Whether you like that or don't like it, whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, we quite clearly do not agree with it. We've said that, but that's it. 
Well, the fans here, of course, a home game. That was the obvious choice for his debut, for the coach to have him at home, to have the home crowd support. We spoke to some of those uh, supporters as they came in uh, to the ground behind me this evening, and really they were very supportive of Falau, saying that they were pleased that he joined their team, uh, that he was good for uh, the Catalans Dragons, but also for the Super League as a whole. Now, there was some controversy, though, because there was two women uh, within the crowd uh, this evening who had brought a a along uh, rainbow flags. They draped them over themselves and they also had some banners. Now, security actually made them take away uh, the banners, although they were left uh, with the flags. But there was a bit of controversy uh, surrounding that here this evening. But, of course, he'll have much uh, more hostile crowd when he plays in the United Kingdom. He won't play next week, but the week after. And that's really where the controversy is because the Super League has made uh, no secret of the fact that it's very disappointed that the Catalans Dragons, uh, this French team, has signed Falau. It's changed its rules now so it can block those sort of signings into the future. And there are a lot of teams that are based in the UK uh, that are very unhappy with this signing. And also, of course, the sponsors of the Catalans Dragons have expressed concern about that signing. And there are now politicians in the UK in the British Parliament that are calling on those sponsors uh, to drop the funding from that team. And that ends Chukai Sports. When we come back, a quick look at the weather for the next 24 hours. Chukai Sports. Chukai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region. Mostly fine weather right across the region in Port Moresby, Daru, Kerama, Alotau and Popandita. In the Mamasa region, fine weather as well, right across the region in Lei, Medang, Wewak and Vanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, fine weather in Loringau, KVN, Kokoporobal and Kimbe, cloudy with a shower or two in Buka. And in the Highlands region, Rain, then fog in Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, showers, then morning fog in Mendi and Wabeg. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus, with you always. And that's the new sport and weather for today, Sunday, 16th February 2020. On behalf of the news team, a pleasant evening. Have a safe working week. Good night. <laughs>